Conversation 1. Excursions for Families. Hi, can I help you? I'd like to find out if you have any excursions suitable for families. Sure. How about taking your family for a cruise? We have a steamship that takes passengers out several times a day. It's over a hundred years old. That sounds interesting. How long is the trip? About an hour and a half. And don't forget to take pictures of the mountains. They're all around you when you're on the boat and they look fantastic. Okay. And I assume there's a cafe or something on board? Sure. How old are your children? Uh, my daughter's 15 and my son's 7. Right. Well, there are various things you can do once you've crossed the lake to make a day of it. One thing that's very popular is a visit to the country farm. You're met off the boat by the farmer and he'll take you to the holding pens where the sheep are kept. Children love feeding them. <laughs> My son would love that. He really likes animals. Well, there's also a 40-minute trek round the farm on a horse if he wants. Do you think he'd manage it? He hasn't done that before. Sure. It's suitable for complete beginners. Ah, good. And again, visitors are welcome to explore the farm on their own, as long as they take care to close gates and so on. There are some very beautiful gardens along the side of the lake, which also belong to the farm. They'll be just at their best now. You could easily spend an hour or two there. OK, well, that all sounds good. And can we get lunch there? You can, and it's very good, though it's not included in the basic cost. You pay when you get there. Right. So is there anything else to do over on that side of the lake? Well, what you can do is take a bike over on the ship and then go on a cycling trip. There's a trail there called the Back Road. You could easily spend three or four hours exploring it, and the scenery's wonderful. They'll give you a map when you get your ticket for the cruise. There's no extra charge. What's the trail like in terms of difficulty? Quite challenging in places. It wouldn't be suitable for your seven-year-old. It needs someone who's got a bit more experience. Hmm. Well, my daughter loves cycling, and so do I, so maybe the two of us could go, and my wife and son could stay on the farm. That might work out quite well, but we don't have bikes here. Is there somewhere we could rent them? Yes, there's a place here in the city. It's called Ratchison's. I'll just make a note of that. Uh, how do you spell it? R A T C H E S O N S. It's just by the cruise ship terminal. Okay. You'd also need to pick up a repair kit for the bike from there to take along with you, and you'd need to take along a snack and some water. It'd be best to get those in the city. Fine. That shouldn't be a problem. And I assume I can rent a helmet from the bike place. Sure, you should definitely get that. It's a great ride, but you want to be well prepared because it's very remote. You won't see any shops around there or anywhere to stay, so you need to get back in time for the last boat. Yeah. So what sort of prices are we looking at here? Let's see. That'd be one adult and one child for the cruise with farm tour. That's $117.00. And an adult and a child for the cruise only, so that's $214 altogether. Oh, wait a minute. How old did you say your daughter was? Fifteen. Then I'm afraid it's $267, because she has to pay the adult fare, which is $75, instead of the child fare, which is $22. Sorry about that. <sighs> that's okay. Uh, so how do we find out? Conversation 2. Public Libraries OK, Stuart. We need to start planning our paper on public libraries. Have you thought of an angle yet? Well, there's so much we could look into. How libraries have changed over the centuries, for instance, or how different countries organise them. What do you think, Trudy? Maybe we should concentrate on this country and try and relate the changes in libraries to external developments, like the fact that far more people can read than a century ago, mm. and that the local population may speak lots of different languages. We could include something about changes in the source of funding too. Yes, but remember we're only supposed to write a short paper, so it's probably best if we don't go into funding in any detail. Right. Well, shall we just... Brainstorm a few ideas to get started. OK. 
We obviously need to look at the impact of new technology, particularly the internet. Now that lots of books have been digitalised, people can access them from their own computers at home. And if everyone did that, libraries would be obsolete. Yes. But the digitalised books that are available online for free are mostly out of copyright, aren't they? And copyright in this country lasts for 70 years after the author dies. So you won't find the latest bestseller or up-to-date information. That's an important point. Anyway, I find it hard to concentrate when I'm reading a long text on a screen. I'd much rather read a physical book. And it takes longer to read on a screen. Oh, I prefer it. I suppose it's just a personal preference. Mm, I expect the libraries will go on evolving in the next few years. Some have already become centres where community activities take place, like local clubs meeting there. I think that'll become even more common. I'd like to think so. And that they'll still be serving their traditional function. But I'm not so sure. There are financial implications after all. What I'm afraid will happen is that books and magazines will all disappear and they'll just be rows and rows of computers. They won't look anything like the libraries we're used to. Well, we'll see. I've just had an idea. Why don't we make an in-depth study of our local public library as background to our paper? Yes, that'd be interesting and raise all sorts of issues. Let's make a list of possible things we could ask about, then work out some sort of structure. For instance, um, we could interview some of the staff and find out whether the library has its own budget or if that's controlled by the local council. And what their policies are. I know they don't allow food, but I'd love to find out what types of noise they ban. There always seems to be a lot of talking, but never music. Mm. I don't know if that's a policy or it just happens. Ah, I've often wondered. Then there are things like how the library is affected by employment laws. I suppose there are rules about working hours, facilities for staff and so on. Right. Then there are other issues relating to the design of the building and how customers use it. Like what measures does the library take to ensure their safety? They'd need floor coverings that aren't slippery. And emergency exits, for instance. Mm. Oh, and another thing, there's the question of the kind of insurance the library needs to have in case anyone gets injured. Yes, that's something else to find out. You know something I've often wondered? What's that? Well, you know they've got an archive of local newspapers going back years. Well, next to it, they've got the diary of a well-known politician from the late 19th century. I wonder why it's there. Do you know what his connection was with this area? No idea. Let's add it to our list of things to find out. Oh, I've just thought, you know, people might ask in the library about local organisations like sports clubs. Mm. Well, I wonder if they keep a database or whether they just look online. Right. I quite fancy finding out what the differences are between a library that's open to the public and one that's part of a museum, for example. They must be very different. Mm. Then something else I'd like to know is... Conversation 3 Asking about the festival. Good morning, Kenton Festival Box Office. How can I help you? Oh, good morning. I'm coming to Kenton for a few days' holiday next month, and a friend told me there's a festival. She gave me this number to find out about it. That's right. The festival begins on the 16th of May and goes on till the 19th. Oh, that's great. I'll be there from the 15th till the 19th. So, could you tell me the programme, please? Well, on the first day, there's the opening ceremony in the town centre. People start gathering around two o'clock to get a good place to see from, and the events will start at 2.45 and finish about 5.30. OK, thanks. I'll make sure I get there early to get a good spot. The festival will be officially opened by the mayor. He'll just speak for a few minutes, welcoming everyone to the festival. All the town councillors will be there. And, of course, lots of other people. Right. Then there'll be a performance by a band. Most years we have a children's choir, but this year the local army cadets offered to perform, and they're very good. Uh huh. After that, a community group from the town will perform a play they've written themselves. Just a short one. 
It's about Helen Tungate. I don't know if you've heard of her. I certainly have. She was a scientist years ago. That's right. She was born in Kenton exactly 100 years ago. So we're celebrating her centenary. I'm a biologist, so I've always been interested in her. I didn't realise she came from Kenton. Yes. Well, all that will take place in the afternoon, and later, as the sun sets, there'll be a firework display. You should go to the park to watch, as you'll get the best view from there. And the display takes place on the opposite side of the river. It's always one of the most popular events in the festival. Sounds great. And what's happening on the other days? There are several events that go on the whole time. For example, the students of the art college have produced a number of videos, all connected with relationships between children and their grandparents. That sounds interesting. It makes a change from children and parents, doesn't it? <laughs> exactly. Because the art college is in use for classes throughout the festival, the videos are being shown in Hansworth House. How do you spell the name? H-A-N-D-S-W-O-R-T-H. Hansworth House. It's close to the town hall. Right. Now, let me see, what else can I tell you about? Are there any displays of ballet dancing? I'm particularly interested in that, as I do it as a hobby. There isn't any ballet, I'm afraid, but there'll be a demonstration of traditional dances from all round the country. Well, that'd be nice. Where is that being held? It's in the market in the town centre. The outdoor one, not the covered market. And it's on at two and five every afternoon of the festival, apart from the first day. Lovely. I'm interested in all kinds of dancing, so I'm sure I'll enjoy that. Mmm, I'm sure you will. And I'd really like to go to some concerts, if there are any. Yes, there are several. Three performed by professionals and one by local children. And where is it being held? It's in the library, which is in Park Street. On the 18th at 6.30 in the evening. I presume I'll need tickets for that. Yes, you can book online or you can buy them when you arrive in Kenton, either at the festival box office or from any shops displaying our logo in the windows. Well, I think that'll keep me busy for the whole of my stay in Kenton. Thank you so much for all your help. You're welcome. I hope you enjoy your stay. Thank you. Goodbye. Conversation 4. The first tutorial. Oh, good morning. Uh, you must be James. I'm Beth Cartwright. Please call me Beth. Thank you. Now, as this is your first tutorial since you started on the Scandinavian Studies course, I'd like to find out something about you. Why did you decide to take this course? Well, my mother is Danish, and although we always lived in England, she used to talk about her home a lot. And that made me want to visit Denmark. We hardly ever did, though. My mother usually went on her own. But whenever her relations or friends were in England, they always came to see us. I see. So I assume you already speak Danish, one of the languages you'll be studying? I can get by when I talk to people, though I'm not terribly accurate. Now, you probably know that you'll spend the third year of the course abroad have you had any thoughts about that? I'm really looking forward to it. And although Denmark seems the obvious place to go because of my family connections, I'd love to spend the time in Iceland. Oh, I'm sure it can be arranged. Do you have any plans for when you graduate? A lot of students go on to take a master's degree. I think the four years of the undergraduate course will be enough for me. I'm interested in journalism and I quite like the idea of moving to Scandinavia and writing for magazines. I'd find that more creative than translating, which I suppose most graduates do. OK. 
Now, how are you finding the courses you're taking this term, James? Well, I'm really enjoying the one on Swedish cinema. That'll continue next term. But the one on Scandinavian literature that's running at the moment will be replaced by more specialized courses. Oh, and by the way, if you're interested in watching Danish television programs, there's going to be a course on that the term after next. That sounds good. Have you started thinking about the literature paper that you have to write in the next few weeks? Yes. My first choice would be to do something on the Icelandic sagas. Hmm. The trouble with that is that a lot of people choose that topic, and it can be difficult to get hold of the books you'll need. Why not leave that for another time? Right. You might find modern novels or 19th century playwrights interesting. I've read or seen several plays in translation, so that would be a good idea. Fine. I'll put you down for that topic. Right. So what would you advise me to aim at in the paper? First, I suggest you avoid taking one writer and going into a great deal of detail. That approach certainly has its place, but I think you first need to get an understanding of the literature in the context of the society in which it was produced, who it was written for, how it was published, and so on. I also think that's more fruitful than placing it within the history of the genre. Okay, that sounds reasonable. Could I ask for some advice about writing the paper I'm working on about the Vikings? I have to do that this week, and I'm a bit stuck. Of course. Have you decided yet what to write about? No, I haven't. There's so much that seems interesting. Viking settlement in other countries, trade, mythology. Well, what I suggest is that you read an assignment a student wrote last year, which is kept in the library. It's short and well-focused, and I'm sure you'll find it helpful. I'll give you the details in a moment. Textbooks usually cover so many topics, it can be very difficult to choose just one. Okay. I've got a DVD of the film about the Vikings that came out earlier this year. Should I watch that again? If it's the one I am thinking of, mm, I'd ignore it. It's more fantasy than reality. But I've got a recording of a documentary that you should watch. It makes some interesting and provocative points, which I think will help you to focus your topic. Right. So then, should I work out an outline? Yes, just headings for different sections at this stage. And then you should start looking for suitable articles and books to draw on, and take notes which you organize according to those headings. I see. Then put short phrases and sentences as bullet points under each heading. Make sure that this skeleton makes sense and flows properly before writing up the paper in full. Okay. Thanks. That's very helpful. Conversation 5. Local Public Library. Hello. Hi, Susie. It's Paul here. How are you? Enjoying your new job? You're working at the library, aren't you? Yes. I started when the library reopened a month ago. It's great. Actually, Carol and I have been meaning to join for a while. Oh, you should. It doesn't cost anything. And the new library has all sorts of facilities. It's not just a place where you borrow books. For instance, there's an area with comfortable seats where you can sit and read the magazines they have there. Some people spend the whole morning there. Mm. Wish I had that amount of time to spend. <laughs> yes, you must be pretty busy at present, with the children and everything. We are, yes. But we're hoping to get away this summer. We're thinking of going to Greece. Well, we've got a much larger section of the library devoted to travel books now, so you should come and have a look. I can't remember if there's anything specifically on Greece, but I should think so. OK. Now, Carol's organising a project for the history class she teaches at school. It's about life in the town a hundred years ago. Do you have anything that might be useful? Yes. Actually, we've now got a new section with materials on the history of the town and surrounding region. Right. I'll tell her. You can't always find that sort of thing on the internet. Now, in the old library, there used to be a separate room with reference books. It was a really nice, quiet room. Yes. We've put those books in the main part of the library now. 
but we do have a room called the community room. It can be hired out for meetings, but at other times, people can use it to study. I might use that. It's hard to find anywhere quiet at home sometimes. I can't remember how old your son and daughter are. We've introduced a special section of fiction written specially for teenagers, but they might be a bit young for that. Yes, they would be. Well, we do have lots of activities for younger children. Yes. For example, we have a science club. At the next meeting, they're going to be doing experiments with stuff that everyone has in the kitchen, sugar and flour and so on. They might be interested, yes. And we have a competition for children called Reading Challenge. That doesn't begin until after the end of term. They have to read six books and they get a certificate if they manage it. So that gives them something to do while they're on holiday, instead of getting bored. That's the idea. And there's special activities for adults too. On Friday, we have a local author called Tanya Streep who's going to be talking about her new novel. It's called Catch the Mouse, and she based the story on a crime that actually took place here years ago. Right. We're not free on Friday, but I'll look out for the book. Now, this probably isn't for you, but we do have IT support available for members. We get quite a few older people coming along who are wanting to get up to speed with computer technology. It's on Tuesday mornings. They don't need to make an appointment or anything. They just turn up. Well, my mother might be interested. I'll let her know. OK. And there's another service which you wouldn't expect from a library, which is a free medical checkup. The hospital arranges for someone to come along and measure the level of sugar in your blood and they check cholesterol levels at the same time. Really? Yes. But that's only for the over 60s, so you wouldn't qualify. OK. Well, I'll tell my mother. She might be interested. What other information? Well, we do have a little shop with things like wall charts and greetings cards and also stamps, so you can post the cards straight away, which is really useful. Yeah. Well, I'll bring the children round at the weekend and we'll join. Oh, one more thing. I'll be bringing the car. Is there parking available? Yes, and it's free in the evening and at weekends. Perfect. Well, thanks, Susie. See you soon. Conversation 6. Tourism Case Study Dave, I'm worried about our case study. I've done a bit of reading, but I'm not sure what's involved in actually writing a case study. I missed the lecture where Dr Baker talked us through it. OK, well, it's quite straightforward. We've got our focus. That's tourism at the Horton Castle site. And you said you'd done some reading about it? Yes, I found some articles and made notes of the main points. Did you remember to keep a record of where you got the information from? Sure. I know what a pain it is when you forget that. OK, so we can compare what we've read. Then we have to decide on a particular problem or need at our site. And then think about who we're going to interview to get more information. OK. So who'd that be? The people who work there? And presumably some of the tourists too? Yes, both those groups. So we'll have to go to the sites to do that, I suppose. But we might also do some of our interviewing away from the site. We could even contact some people here in the city, like administrators involved in overseeing tourism. OK, so we'll need to think about our interview questions and fix times and places for the meetings. It's all going to take a lot of time. Mm. And if we can, we should ask our interviewees if they can bring along some numerical data that we can add to support our findings. And photographs? I think we have plenty of those already. 
But Dr. Baker also said we have to establish with our interviewees whether we can identify them in our case study or whether they want to be anonymous. Oh, I wouldn't have thought of that. OK, once we've got all this information, I suppose we have to analyse it. Yes, put it all together and choose what's relevant to the problem we're focusing on and analyse that carefully to find out if we can identify any trends or regularities there. That's the main thing at this stage, rather than concentrating on details or lots of facts. OK, and then once we've analysed that, what next? Well, then we need to think about what we do with the data we've selected to make it as clear as possible to our readers. Things like graphs or tables or charts. Right. Then the case study itself is mostly quite standard. We begin by presenting the problem and giving some background, then go through the main sections. But the thing that surprised me is that in a normal report, we'd end with some suggestions to deal with the problem or need we identified. But in a case study, we end up with a question or a series of questions to our readers and they decide what ought to be done. Oh, I hadn't realised that. So, basically, the problem we're addressing in our case study of the Horton Castle site is why so few tourists are visiting it. And we'll find out more from our interviews, but I did find one report on the internet that suggested that one reason might be because as far as transport goes, access is difficult. I read that too, but that report was actually written 10 years ago when the road there was really bad, but that's been improved now. And I think there's plenty of fascinating stuff there for a really good day out, but you'd never realise it from the castle website. Maybe that's the problem. Yes, it's really dry and boring. I read somewhere a suggestion that what the castle needs is a visitor centre. So we could have a look for some information about that on the internet. What would we need to know? Well, who'd use it for a start? It'd be good to know what categories the visitors fell into too, like school parties or retired people. But I think we'd have to talk to staff to get that information. OK. And as we're thinking of suggesting a visitor centre, we'd also have to look at potential problems. I mean, obviously it wouldn't be cheap to set up. No, but it could be a really good investment. And as it's on a historical site, it'd need to get special planning permission, I expect. That might be hard. Right. Especially as the only possible place for it would be at the entrance, and that's right in front of the castle. Hmm. But it could be a good thing for the town of Horton. At present, it's a bit of a ghost town. Once they've left school and got any skills or qualifications, the young people all get out as fast as they can to get jobs in the city. And the only people left are children and those who've retired. Right. Something else we could investigate would be the potential damage that tourists might cause to the castle site. I mean, their environmental impact. At present, the tourists can just wander around wherever they want. But if numbers increase, there might have to be some restrictions, like sticking to marked ways. And there'd need to be guides and wardens around to make sure these are enforced. Yes, we could look at that too. OK, well, we certainly... Man Conversation 7 Cycle to a leader. Hello, Pembroke Cycling Holidays. Bob speaking. Oh, hello. I've seen your advert for people to lead cycle trips. Are you the right person to speak to? Yes, I am. Could I have your name, please? It's Margaret Smith. Are you looking for a permanent job, Margaret? No, temporary. I've got a permanent job starting in a few months' time, and I want to do something else until then. What work do you do? This will probably sound crazy. I used to be a lawyer, and then I made a complete career change, and I'm going to be a doctor. I've just finished my training. Right. 
And have you had any experience of leading cycle trips? Yes, I've led several bike tours in Africa. The trip to India that I had arranged to lead next month has now been cancelled. So when I saw you were advertising for tour leaders, I decided to apply. OK. Now, we normally have two or three leaders on a trip, depending on the size of the group. Some tours are for very experienced cyclists, but we've got a tour coming up soon in Spain, which is proving so popular we need an additional leader. It's a cycling holiday for families. Would that suit you? It certainly would. I enjoy working with children, and I probably need some more experience before I go on a really challenging trip. That tour includes several teenagers. Have you worked with that age group before? Yes. I'm a volunteer worker in a youth club where I help people to improve their cycling skills. Before that, I helped out in a cycling club where I taught beginners. Well, that's great. Now, the trip I mentioned is just for a fortnight, but there might be the possibility of leading other tours after that. Would that fit in with your plans? That'd be fine. I'll be free for five months. My job is due to start on October the 2nd and I'm available from May the 1st until late September. Good. Now, is there anything I need to know about the food you eat? We usually have one or two people in the group who don't eat meat or have some sort of food allergy, so we're always very careful about that. Yes, I'm allergic to cheese. Would that be a problem? No. As long as we have enough notice, we can deal with that. That's great. It sounds really interesting. Would you like me to fill in an application form? Yes, please. Where should I post it to? Could you send it to 27 Arbuthnot Place? A-R-B-U-T-H-N-O-T Place, Dumfries. And what's the postcode, please? D-G-7-4-P-H. Was that P-Papa or B-Bravo? Papa. Got that. If you could return the application form by Friday this week, we can interview you on Tuesday next week. Say, half past two? Would that be possible for you? Yes, it's fine. You're quite a long way from where I live, so I'll drive over on Monday. Should I bring anything to the interview? We'll have your application form, of course, but we'll need to see any certificates you've got that are relevant in cycling, first aid or whatever. OK. And at the interview, we'd like to find out about your experience of being a tour guide. So, could you prepare a ten-minute talk about that, please? You don't need slides or any complicated equipment. Just some notes. Right. I'll start thinking about that straight away. <laughs> Good. Well, we'll look forward to receiving your application form and we'll contact you to confirm the interview. Thanks very much. Thank you, Margaret. Goodbye. Bye. Conversation 8. Film Studies Joe, you know I'm giving a presentation in our film studies class next week? Yes. Well, could we discuss it? I could do with getting someone else's opinion. Of course, Katie. What are you going to talk about? It's about film adaptations of Shakespeare's plays. I've got very interested in all the different approaches that film directors take. Uh huh. So I thought I'd start with Janetti, who's a professor of film and literature. And in one of his books, he came up with a straightforward classification of film adaptations based on how faithful they are to the original plays and novels. Right. I've already made some notes on that. So I just need to sort those out before the presentation. I thought that next I'd ask the class to come up with the worst examples of Shakespeare adaptations that they've seen and to say why. That should be more fun than having their favourite versions. Yes, I can certainly think of a couple. <laughs> right. Next, I want to talk about Rachel Malko. I came across something on the internet about her work on film adaptations and I was thinking of showing some film clips to illustrate her ideas. Will you have enough time, though? 
both to prepare and during the presentation. After all, I doubt if you'll be able to find all the clips you want. Mm, perhaps you're right. OK, well, I'd better do some slides instead, saying how various films relate to what she says. That should encourage discussion. Mm. Next, I want to say something about how plays may be chosen for adaptation because they're concerned with issues of the time when the film is made. You mean things like patriotism or the role of government? Exactly. It's quite tricky, but I've got a few ideas I'd like to discuss. And finally, I want to talk about a few adaptations that I think illustrate a range of approaches and make some comments on them. Do you know the Japanese film Ran? I haven't seen it. It was based on Shakespeare's King Lear, wasn't it? That's right. It was a very loose adaptation, using the same situation and story, but moving it to 16th century Japan instead of 16th century Britain. So, for example, the king's daughters become sons, because in Japanese culture at that time, women couldn't succeed to the throne. OK. I hope you're going to talk about the 1993 film of Much Ado About Nothing. I think that's one of the best Shakespeare films. It really brings the play to life, doesn't it? Yes, I agree. And I think filming it in Italy, where the play is set, makes you see what life was like at the time of the play. Absolutely. Right. What's next? Uh, next, I thought Romeo and Juliet, the 1996 film, which moves the action into the present day. Yes, it worked really well, I thought, changing the two feuding families in the original to two competing business empires, even though they're speaking in the English of the original play. You'd expect it would sound really bizarre, but I found I soon got used to it. Me too. Then I thought I'd include a real Hollywood film, one that's intended to appeal to a mass commercial audience. There must be quite a number of those. Yes, but I've picked the 1996 film of Hamlet. It included every line of the text, but it's more like a typical action hero movie. There are loads of special effects, but no unifying interpretation of the play. All show and no substance. Exactly. Then there's Prospero's books, based on The Tempest. That was really innovative from a stylistic point of view. Didn't it include dance and singing and animation as well as live actors? Yes, it did. I also want to mention Looking for Richard. Did you ever see it? No, but I've read about it. It was a blend of a documentary with a few scenes from Richard III, wasn't it? That's right. It's more a way of looking into how people nowadays connect with the playwright. The play is really just the starting point. And that'll be where I finish. Well, it sounds as though it'll be very interesting.